Afternoon, lads. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good, thank thanks. you. Yeah. I mean, I was interested, yeah, just to get, to sort of take the temperature of Manchester United fans watching that, what he had to say, and what do you think it may have achieved, good or bad? Good. Um, it's funny because I think that um, the, the, the the two sides of the coin sort of came together and, and actually both probably came out of it quite well, apart from the actual recording, which I thought was a bit wrong. But I think... Manchester United might have been quite pleasantly surprised how that came out because communication is something we don't get as fans. And one thing we did get on Saturday was, yeah, a puppet master for the Glazers, of course, he's employed by them. But we did get some communication that we really don't get unless it's from a journalist who's close to the club, who may be watering it down or favouring the club. And I think that interaction was actually quite refreshing, in my opinion. Do you, I wonder I think they would play with the ownership and, and the club. I mean, he's, he, look, he was pretty on the nose about what was going on, how much money, got a bit sweary at times, spoke the fans' language and all that and said, you know, we've, uh, we've blown an awful lot of money, said, you know, we're going to have to find investment from elsewhere so there could be a new official, I don't know, mattress uh, supplier to Manchester United who will pay for the new training ground and, and changes to the stadium. I mean, a club that is so rich, you, you, you know, to hear the CEO say, well, look, we're going to have to, we're going to spend some money, we're going to have to find some money from elsewhere. Yeah, I, th- I mean, look, the, the, the problem Manchester United fans have is that you will get a Bolton Wanderers fan or a Nottingham Forest fan or a Fulham fan saying, oh, it must be really hard to only have a budget of 120 million and to have wasted a billion over the last 10 years. And of course, they're absolutely right. It's like the guy in his Ferrari moaning because he's run out of petrol and <laughs> you're, you're walking to work. But the issue we have as United fans is that, and the best way of, of explaining it is, if Manchester United generate two pounds, a pound of it goes on debt or to the Glazers. So we look at what Man City are doing and spend the money they're spending. And Manchester United could be spending a lot more if we didn't have the Glazers in charge. So that was, I, I liked what Richard Arnold said when he said, I look at that training ground and I don't see where the billion's been spent because yeah, you, you may as well have burnt it. It's been really badly spent. But also um, one, one of the other, the other issue I took is that when he says, you know, we're going to have to look to raise money other way, almost like, they're pleading poverty. It's Manchester United. Like we've got one of the biggest fan bases in the world. There's a lot of money there. Unfortunately, it's tied up in debt and dividend payments. And that's why those fans were there, really. Let's be honest. Yeah, it's all, it has been a problem. But the fans seem pretty confident they can get rid of the Glazers. Uh, um, one of the fans quoted said, the Glazers are on the ropes. Let's get rid of them once and for all. And you think the Glazers are only going if they want to go. If they get the right offer for the club, then they'll go. Otherwise, why would they go? It's a perfect cash cow for them, isn't it? It is. And um, if you look at the last 16, 17 years they've been there, then, I mean, unfortunately, you, and, and this is why fans are, are very frustrated, you, you can predict what they're doing. They're not football people. They bought the club on debt. It was a business opportunity. And we're at our lowest ebb on the pitch. I, I was saying this morning, this is the worst United side I've watched in my lifetime. It's not the worst set of players, but 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 the where the club is, it, it's not very good. And you could almost look at the Glazers and say, well, the club still makes enough money then for them to take their dividends. They're going to take some dividends this week, apparently. And if they are milking the cow, I still think there's some milk to come out of the cow before they think, right, let, let, let's let's sell up. So that's the fear of United fans with the Glazers. I know that people feel that they've got them on the ropes, but they've been on the ropes for many years and they're still there and they're still making money. So It's going to be very interesting to see what happens because the summer will dictate a lot as well. If we buy four or five players, the honest answer is that will that will change the mood amongst a lot of fans, not those hardcore fans who are who are adamant about getting the Glazers out. But you need everybody on board, really. Do you think do you think this has changed perceptions of of uh, Arnold? I mean, you sort of said, yeah, you know, look, work works for the Glazers and has to kind of do their bidding, obviously. But do you think people are saying Manchester United fans will maybe give him a bit more of a chance than they would have done before he sat down in the pub yesterday with those fans? Well, that's the funny thing. I think it will galvanise fans who don't really want the gate Glazers in charge. But then in a funny way, the CEO who's employed by the Glazers is now actually probably more popular than he was on Friday evening mm. because he's, he's, he's spoken openly about the money being there for the manager and the director of football. He, he's acknowledged the bad spending of the past. And, and it, is an, it is a weird situation because most Man United fans, I'd say all Man United fans, want to get rid of the Glazers. But there is an admission that this is a new uh, CEO. Uh, I think uh, Eric Ten Hag being appointed was applauded. I applauded it. Many United fans applauded it because Pochettino probably was the sort of appointment we would have made pre-Richard Arnold. So there is a real hunger within the club to change. 
but how much can you change when you've got the Glazers as your boss? And, and that's going to be the interesting thing, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think Ten Hag is a good choice too, but he's got a big job on his hands. Yeah. You know, anybody has to overtake City, Liverpool, Spurs look very strong. Arsenal are strengthening. Everybody's strengthening. Villa. So it's going to be difficult, isn't it, for United to pick, you know, they finished sixth last year and they'd had a terrible season. So I think fourth is probably the best they can aim for, I'd reckon. Yeah, and, and United fans, we're all willing to give Ten Hag a chance. He was the fans' choice, let's be honest. Uh, but then most of the summer so far, we're trying to spend £70 million on De Jong and give him over £300,000 a week. And you've got to back the new manager. But the trouble with that is that Eric Ten Hag hasn't been watching United or uh, like a United fan has for the last nine years. And Louis van Gaal got Di Maria for £60 million. That failed. Jose Mourinho got Paul Pogba for £90 million. That failed. Oli Gunnar Solskjaer got Harry Maguire for £80 million. That failed. So we're a little bit like, oh, spending all the, you know, a, a large amount of money on one player again. The hope is this time that because Ten Hag is such a technical coach, he's probably looked at De Jong and gone, that is a midfielder that's going to completely revolutionise the way United play. But you're right, Arsenal are spending a lot, Spurs are spending well. So it's not about really even catching Liverpool and Man City. It's about trying to get back in the top four for us over the next 12 months. And the other interesting point, finally, was uh, Mark when he said, "You know, do you want me buying the players? Does that sound familiar?" I thought that that was very interesting. Um, he, he knows how badly that went before, and I thought that was quite a telling remark. <clears throat> well, it's terrifying, really. I think that what came out of Saturday is that the CEO, whether he wanted to or not, spoke publicly. Uh, I, I don't agree with it being secret, secretly recorded. I think take a few photos, and the people there can put the you know, their thoughts out. But the reality is, if you look at Dortmund and Bayern, their CEO, their sporting director, they speak and communicate with their fans quite regularly. Mourinho said at United, you're the manager and you're everything because no one else will talk. And I hope Manchester United do take that on board, that communicating with your fans isn't necessarily a bad thing. And certainly not acknowledging your, you know, acknowledging your your failings of the last nine years. I think that was the that was the big line for me when he said, I look at the training ground and I don't know where we spent a billion pounds. Mm. All right, you're throwing the previous CEO under the bus, but managers come in and go, these players aren't fit. That's the whole, that, that's football. So I think United need to probably wake up and, 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 and uh, acknowledge and own some of their past mistakes because that communication was, was massive on Saturday and it, and it, has, it has done them some good. I wonder if you'd ever do it again, finally, Mark. I wonder if Richard Arnold... I mean, because, you know, the idea of meeting the fans the way he did impromptu, you said it was recorded, so we did get to hear a lot of what he said and he, he kind of spoke the language of the fans. If he were to do it again, it probably would be a fans forum, <clears throat> wouldn't it? And then it would be a lot more guarded and a lot more corporate. So, you know, this unless he's just going to pop into local pubs before kickoff or Manchester United Legends nights and, and have a chat with fans, this is probably as good as it's ever going to get in terms of unguarded communication between the hierarchy at the club and supporters. 100% I agree with that because I think if you're interviewing the same person each week, every week you've got to try and make it better, haven't you? And how do you make it any better than what they did on Saturday? So mm. he'd probably face harder questions, more volatile questions. So... Yeah, I, I would imagine that's the end of it. But I would hope it's not the end of it, like you hinted at there. Maybe there are interviews he can do with, you know, I'd love him to do one with the United Stand for a start. He could do one with fan forums. He could do one with uh, fanzines and things like that, where it's a little bit more, you'd still want the, the, the big questions answers. And, mm. and I'd hope that he would want to do that. But yeah, that sort of an environment, I, I would imagine that's the end of that sort of thing, yeah. Paul Hawksby and Andy Jacobs, Monday to Friday afternoons, 1 till 4, on AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app, and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.